Carbs are the number one fuel source for cyclists. And recently, I came here to Exeter University to find out how efficient I am at using the carbs I consume whilst riding. And the results surprised me. And in this video, I'm going to explain why. To do this, I've enlisted the help of renowned performance nutritionist, Dr. Tim Podlicker, who has worked with pro teams, Tudor Pro Cycling and Red Bull Bora Hansgrohe. When it comes to carbs, is more really better? And have we forgotten the importance of other fuel sources on our bikes? Carbs are a key buzzword at the moment in pro cycling, with more and more riders increasing the amount they consume per hour. And it seems that recently, the aim of the game has been to eat as much as you can when riding. But now, thanks to better knowledge and testing, it's possible to really know what our optimal carb fueling levels should actually be, to take out the guesswork. And today, I've been invited by Dr. Tim Podlicker down to Exeter University in the UK to do just that. To test for this, I'll be riding for two and a half hours whilst consuming 120 grams of glucose per hour. By analysing my breath samples, it will be possible to accurately see how much of that glucose is actually used during my effort. While I continue with the test, it's worth diving into some of the key differences that have tripped me up in the past on the topic of high carb fueling. Namely, what is the difference between carbohydrate absorption, oxidation and tolerance? And even more so, are either of these elements trainable? So to start with the oxidation rate, this means how many carbohydrates you're using during exercise. So how much of the ingested carbohydrates either by drink, bars, juice, gels, you actually end up using to fuel um, your um, cycling. Then you have absorption, which is basically usually when you're riding at a moderate intensity, the same as um, oxidation rate. So how much of the carbohydrates are going, are coming from the intestines into the bloodstream and then end up being oxidized. Usually at moderate intensity exercise or even a higher intensity exercise, um, 97 to 100% of the absorbed carbohydrates would be um, oxidized. So basically um, it, uh, the, the, the terms can be used interchangeably. Um, whereas um, the tolerance on the other hand basically talks about how much carbohydrates you can tolerate but not necessarily absorb. So how much you can have into your stomach or your in intestine, um, and you can expand this area quite a bit. So intestines can be get bigger, stomach can be full, but this does not necessarily mean that you can actually absorb those carbohydrates. And there is one thing I haven't mentioned before is that when the intensity is relatively low, we are talking about really like low intensity, just spinning the legs, the absorption might actually be um, higher than oxidation, and this is when you can actually replenish um, the glycogen stores. I can feel uh, I can feel that my stomach's working. I'm on that ear limit. It really is hard work to get it in, and definitely feel more nauseous. 35 minutes to go. This is my third from last carb drink, and it's a chore to get down. I hate being sick. <laughs> oh. Oh. So, finished the test, two and a half hours done. Hard enough in terms of power, but I'd say the last hour really struggled with, uh, with my stomach and just getting 
and getting the, uh, the glucose in, it was like every bottle started getting harder and harder and you'd almost feel a bit better and then you'd have another bottle and it was like, wow. So by the end I was really, really nauseous. I've had to take like just 15, 20 minutes just to let myself feel, start to feel normal again. Um, but yeah, quite remarkable really. I didn't expect to struggle that much. It was, it was, it was my idea to up the carbs, up the glucose, but yeah, in a bit of a bad way. Yeah, so um, it's very it's individual, I would say. Um, it kind of feels like that you really struggled with this high amount of um, carbohydrates you had. Um, this could be down to basically the fact that we gave you way too much, so you were the tolerance um, was not um, sufficient to basically sustain 120 grams of glucose per hour. Um, likely you would be finding 120 of grams of glucose and fructose, which is what we find in the products these days, but because we wanted to really test the glucose as the main component of carbohydrate drinks, we wanted to go really high. Um, and because there is some evidence that tall people could perhaps oxidize 90 grams per hour, uh, we need to go a bit higher. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, that meant that there were a lot of gastrointestinal issues. But it's, yeah, it varies a lot. Um, and it seems that probably it relates to the absorption capacity, which may or may not be related to body size, but also your gut tolerance and how used you are to eating a lot of carbohydrates. Test complete. It was time to send my results off to be analyzed. After a few weeks wait, I then returned to Exeter to go through those results with Tim. I'm back, back in the lab. It's bringing back memories. <laughs> quite, quite a tough morning for myself. Uh, you've sent the data all off though. You've got the results back. I'm really interested to find out what my results were from that test because I've always felt that I could eat like a horse, but I'm, I'm not sure if the results are going to show that. So yeah, talk me through it. What we found out was that um, your oxidation rates of ingested glucose went up to um, 46 grams per hour, which is actually below what current knowledge kind of recommends to people or like suggests that people can oxidize 60 grams of glucose per hour. And we have some athletes out there that can definitely oxidize more. We thought that would be the case in your case because you are much taller, um, but that did not happen. Um, and there are kind of many explanations um, why that would be the case. And just to be clear, it's so that 46 grams, that's just glucose. So if I was taking sports nutrition, what would you be advising me to take based on those results? So yeah, then we would basically base our, uh, base our recommendations depending on the um, glucose fructose ratio of the products you were using. Um, and you, we always go a bit, a bit higher. So instead of like 46 grams of glucose and um, half of the fructose for two to one ratio. So in two to one ratio products, we would <clears throat> get to like 70 to 85 grams per hour recommendation, um, which is not too, too dissimilar of what current like general sports nutrition recommendations are actually saying up to 90 grams per hour. Or if you had one to 0 0.8 um, um, ratio products, so meaning a bit more fructose, we would change the recommendation is come to like 85 to 100 grams per hour. Okay. Um, so it's still quite a lot of carbohydrates, but far away from what I guess we were all expecting to see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of on the upper end of what I would have been advised still when I was racing from like five or six years ago. But compared to some of those like huge numbers we're seeing and some of the stories of, we're hearing from the pro peloton of riders consuming vast amounts of carbs per hour, it is pretty low. I'm six foot eight. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I've got a reputation for eating loads of food. Why do you think my numbers are low? I thought they were going to be on the high side. I was hoping to break some records. So usually on a like perfect day, a person comes to the lab, um, is well rested. Um, we set the intensity correctly. Um, it's not too high. It's not too low. And we get a really nice number. Um, in your case, you had some gastrointestinal discomfort the day before. Um, and this can definitely have an effect on the day as well, because there is some evidence from the past that people, when they're like low in glycogen, so didn't sufficiently fuel their glycogen stores the day before, can actually have their oxidation rates reduced by around 
30% or up to 30%. Wow. So if we applied these to your numbers, we would get to much higher number to start with, um, which would be probably more of more closer to what we would expect it from you. Yeah, I think that's my own feelings, because as I said to you, I wasn't feeling the greatest coming into the test. And then I felt okay though to start, like I felt fine. Like if I was on a race day, I'd have been like, yeah, that's fine. It wasn't like a major issue, but I just, once the test progressed, I started to feel it more and more and I was struggling to, to like, my stomach was just struggling. <laughs> but that kind of tallies with my own feelings from when I was racing and my diff different kind of sorts of days I've had on the bike, where some days you just feel amazing, you can eat loads, you can fuel loads, and some days you just can't. Is that something that you've seen? Like, and your carb oxidation rate, is that just a static number or is that going, is that going to change? Yeah, everything is very fluid and dynamic in, when it comes to like physiology. Nothing is like set in stone and this is the number you see. Like everything changes, even your view to max as the, like the most simple value that we measure in exercise physiology lab changes day to day basically. And probably this number, so exogenous or ingest, oxidation rates of ingested carbohydrates change as well, depending on the environmental conditions. We know that altitude suppresses these rates. We know that heat suppresses these rates. We know that um, having insufficient fueling the day before affects these rates. And there are probably some other things that we don't know. Um, so we usually try to basically measure the rates um, in the best possible way. So when person is uh, well rested, healthy, no problems and get the peak rates and then in the field then nutritionists would recommend different rates based on like different conditions or uh, how the athlete is feeling. Um, but at least we kind of tick the box of knowing what the maximal rate is, the similar way as you would measure maximal sweat um, rates during exercise and then basically apply or do design a um, hydration strategy around that. Okay, so it's like once you have those numbers, it gives you a really good ballpark to work with, I guess. Yeah. It's really interesting to take a look at my results, actually. I think all the other times when I've been fueling on the bike, it's been based on advice and my own feelings and just trying to have that sort of sensation of what works and what doesn't. And now I've got a proper snapshot into what I can do in a period of time. But still, I'm a little kind of like deflated that my numbers aren't as high as I thought they would be for my size and my body type. They're actually relatively low. To find out though what I can do with those results from a more kind of practical standpoint, I thought I'd catch up with Sam Shepard, Head of Sports Science at Precision Fuel and Hydration. I suppose if you like look at the messaging, we're always talking about taking on more carbohydrate, you know, higher is better. You see these terms a lot in on, in social media and, and what athletes are doing as well. You know, even at Precision, we see our athletes probably, when we look at our database over the last few years, the, the average intakes have probably increased across most sports. Um, but of course, those guys are working at the, you know, they're, they're at the highest level of racing. Um, I think, you know, we also need to be able to use fat as a fuel efficiently. And it sounds like you've got some capacity to do that. Um, and it comes down to context, really, of what we're trying to achieve. And again, we're talking about very high intakes of carbohydrate across racing. But what are people actually doing in training day to day? Yes, some sessions will necessitate a high carbohydrate ingestion rate to support the work you're doing during those sessions. But equally, if we're doing an easier zone one, zone two type session, then there is an argument to say, well, actually, we can fuel at a much lower level and we should fuel at a much lower level. To be to be able to or, or ask our bodies to use more fat as a fuel and and, or, and ultimately come better at using fat as a fuel. So when you know the dynamics of a race um, dictate that we can lean more on fat as a fuel and therefore preserve our muscle glycogen uh, content and, and and also our liver glycogen content um, and save that for later on when we're going to need it in a race, then then we we want our bodies to be able to do that. So I, I think, yeah, we've, we've sort of forgotten about it, um, but we also need, you know, we need to consider the context of the training that we're trying to do and the racing that we're trying to do as to how important it is that we train that capacity to use fat as a, to use fat as a fuel. 
To wrap things up, it's been really interesting to get a proper glimpse into exactly how my body is able to make use of the carbs I consume whilst riding and use that knowledge to better inform my own fueling strategy when I get out on the bike. Personally, I'll admit, I'm a little disappointed not to be some carb-destroying giant after seeing my results. I thought this would be the one area I could potentially say I had a real talent for. But jokes aside, I think it does show how personalised nutrition can be out on the bike. And also, as Tim mentioned, all the research points to the fact that carb oxidation is probably not something you're able to train for. But tolerance for carbs, how much you can actually stomach, potentially is which is a practical aspect of riding that is worth paying attention to. What has also been made clear to me is just how much a role fitness plays in fueling strategy too. How depending on the relative intensity of your riding, your body can move between mostly fats or carbs as a fuel source, and just how much that can impact your performance. Also, this whole experience has been a reminder of just how crucial glycogen stores are, and why carb loading before an event is so important before you head out on the bike because once you're out there, you're really limited into how much fuel you can actually take on during each effort. So starting properly well stocked is so key because it's so hard to catch back up. I'm really curious to see where this kind of testing goes from here though. How might shape our own fueling strategies and those of pros? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below on this. And as always, thanks for watching. Enjoy the riding and those carbs.